I don't like calling them exercises because that sounds too mechanical. Only do these loving contemplations of your experience when that seems to you the most interesting and enjoyable thing you could possibly be doing at that moment. So you do it in the same way that you, you look out here across the fields and you think, oh, it's so inviting, I, I just love to go for a walk. And you go for that reason, just, it's just the thing you'd want to be doing more than anything else at that moment. The most interesting, the most enjoyable. That, that, that's when to do these loving contemplations. When nothing interests you more in that moment than exploring the reality of your experience. What is all we know is experience. I mean, isn't that the most extraordinary miracle that there is experience? I mean, walking on water just pales into insignificance next to the fact that there is experience. Wow. I mean, isn't that incredible? And that experience is made of something, yeah? That it's made of something. What is it made of? That it can take the shape of all this. It can take the shape of this incredible diversity. And yet it's all the same stuff called knowing or experiencing. What could that stuff be? <laughs> what could be more interesting interesting than, than knowing what that stuff is? Our culture tells us that it's made out of dead stuff called matter and that matter gives rise to mind and mind gives rise to consciousness. Does experience, is the stuff out of which experience is made dead and inert? That doesn't quite make sense because if that was true then experience would be essentially dead and inert. But it's not. All experience is pervaded by the knowing of it. It is aware and alive. Everything. We never come in contact with anything other than this totally alive stuff called experience and it never goes away. It doesn't start or stop. It stays the same, it's never changing, but ever changing. What is this stuff? So when you feel that kind of interest in experience, then follow it. If you find something more interesting to do than that, then do it. <laughs> like going to the cinema or, or... It's fine, do whatever is the most interesting thing for you at that moment, the most enjoyable, interesting thing. I mean, spiritual life should be just, it should be like going to the best party you can imagine. It should be the most enjoyable, the most interesting thing to do. And the beauty of it is that the, it, you don't have to put aside a particular time or a particular place to do it. You can do it while you're having lunch, while you're walking down the street, while you're brushing your teeth, while you're sitting on your chair doing nothing. You, you can explore this all the time. To, to make a practice out of it, to make a discipline out of it, is, is blasphemous. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's so disrespectful to think that we could in, turn this investigation, this exploration of our experience into a practice or a discipline. It's it's so disrespectful. I guess it comes to my mind that it feels so good when I do it that it just made sense to me to do it when I feel suffering. In order, just to, in order keep, to heal that. Keep life simple, Jeremy. Just no. do it when you feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. When you're suffering, when you're happy, when you're... Um, 
in between somewhere. Just do it whenever you feel this is what I love to do. Don't, don't do it as a practice when you're suffering in order to get rid of suffering. Don't do it for a reason. Just do it because it is the most interesting thing to do for its own sake. Like, like a mad scientist studying the stuff that a particular rare species of butterflies, uh, studying a butterfly's wing, a rare butterfly, what its wing is made out of, why it's that fluorescent green. I mean, what a crazy thing to do. But people spend their lives doing this. It's so beautiful, just f for the joy of, of, of discovery. Just, it, it's not for any reason. When you're, uh, and that's how an artist works, in, uh, and a sports person, in the moment, they are just dancing for no reason. Whether that dance takes on the form of scientific exploration, or creativity, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just do it for no reason, for no, not in order to gain something at the end, just because it's the most enjoyable, most interesting thing you could do at that moment. Is them, is uh, I mean, them. it's just a little disappointing because <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean because honestly I mean I'm, I, on, yeah I do feel suffering a lot less but that happened to be the most prevalent you know part of my daily life and so I did want to get rid of it and, okay, and I wanted to use everything I could to do it so but 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 and th that does seem to be the promise of where this is all heading. Okay, but just, just very slightly change the parameters. In, instead of doing this in order to get rid of suffering, do it to understand suffering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Th th so it's just, it, you're still studying the same thing. You're still exploring the same thing. Changing the mindset that way. But you're just doing it, you, th 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 this phenomena is appearing called suffering. This rare, this strange <laughs> species of butterfly has appeared, and you're fascinated by it. Oh, you know, oh, how do you eat? How do you reproduce? How do you go around your life? You want to study all of its habits, and and but you have to be very very careful with the butterfly. It's very delicate. You don't want to touch it. You touch it, and you're going to destroy it because it's so. Sad. So you you just. Observe it. Don't touch it. Don't get busy trying to change the butterfly. You just you're, you're studying it under all sorts of different. You study it in the daytime, in the night, when its mates are around, when they're not, what it eats, what it goes towards. You're, you're just interested in this phenomenon. Yeah. See suffering just like a phenomenon. After all, it is a phenomenon. Just, just explore it. Be interested in it. Don't go to war with it. Because you, you don't, suffering is already made out of resistance. By going to war with it, you are just resisting it. You are piling one resistance on top of an already existing resistance. You are compounding the problem, compounding the suffering by trying to get rid of it. And that's why, as we all know very well, all the conventional means of getting rid of suffering don't work. They just, at best, temporarily alleviated, but subtly perpetuated. So take your hands off suffering. Explore it out of interest. What are you made of? Yeah. So it's fine. When you find yourself suffering, think, okay, great. Here, here this, uh, this butterfly has appeared again. Yeah. I'm going to explore it. Yeah. Explore it at the level of the mind and explore it at the level of the body, both. Really 
think and feel, I want to understand this phenomenon that takes place or that appears so often in my life. It seems like it's related to these perceptual investigations in yes, the sense that yes, it is. you're like, wow, it, when the suffering is occurring, it tends to be that there's this kind of contracted yes, absolutely. aspect. And when we're doing that breathing exercise, yes. you realize, wow, it's yes, exactly. you're infinite. Th that's what these these contemplations, like the contemplation we did this morning, is yeah. is just studying one of the butterfly's legs, just one part of it. <laughs> and, you know, yesterday we studied another leg or another wing. It's just all studying this whole phenomenon of, so, of uh, yeah. in this case, the sense of separation. So it puts it in perspective, but I can see why if you approach that exercise with the desire to get rid of something, then it would be counterproductive. In that yes. S -s suffering, the only thing suffering cannot stand is being seen clearly. The reason for that is that at the root of suffering is an illusion. You can't do anything to, to an illusion because there's nothing there you can't do anything to the water in a mirage. You can't go and collect it. You can't purify it. You can't drink it. You can't, you can't do anything to it because it's not there. The very best you can do is to go up to it and see that it's not there. That seeing relieves the desire to, to, to manage it or collect it. or to. So it's like that with suffering. At the heart of suffering, there is an illusion a non-existent self. You can't do anything to a non-existent self. There is nothing there to do anything to. Seeing, which means experiential understanding, clear seeing is the best you can do. And as a result, as, as a byproduct of that clear seeing, this suffering vanishes, dissolves in time. Because it, in order to remain present, suffering needs the illusion of a separate self. It revolves around the illusion of a separate self. If that is truly seen to be non-existent, the suffering simply cannot stand. There may be old habits in the body-mind that run for some time. But those, because they are no longer supported, by the belief and feeling of a separate self, these old habits gradually dissipate. So suffering vanishes as a byproduct of this exploration, not as its goal. Suffering vanishes in the same way that a headache vanishes. You wake up in the morning with a headache, and you get to the evening and you realize, oh, my headache's gone. I don't know when it went. I don't know where I was when it went. I don't know why it went. I don't know how it went. It's just, you just notice, oh, it's just not there anymore. That's how suffering disappears. It's a byproduct, not a goal. Its disappearance is a byproduct, not a goal. If you make it your goal, you perpetuate suffering. In fact, this is one of the ways the separate self perpetuates itself, sometimes for decades, by trying to get rid of itself. This feels like it leaves me in the position of we, we, we learn all these things and it seems like it would be a nice idea to repeat them, to explore them better. But truly, it's like the suffering that pro reminds me that I want to practice them. But if it's counterproductive to apply them. No, consider the suffering is to the mind what pain is to the body. Yeah? You put your hand in the fire, you experience pain. The pain is not a mistake. It's not something that's wrong. The pain is there. It's the intelligence of the body telling you, take your hand out of the fire. Yeah? So pain is working on behalf of your well-being. Suffering is exactly the same at the level of the mind. 
It is cooperating with your desire for happiness. It's telling you you've got your hand in the fire. In this case, it's telling you you have mistaken yourself for a separate, limited awareness. Take a look. I take a look. Take a look. That's what suffering... So, so suffering is to the mind what pain is to the body. It's just a wake-up call. It's saying you've mistaken yourself for an object, for a limited self. Have another look. But you're basically saying when you take a look, you're not doing it to get rid of it. You're just doing it to see what's there. You're doing it in order to look at the separate self that you have mistaken yourself for. In that moment, you are thinking and feeling on behalf of a separate self. So you are now looking at the separate self on whose behalf you are thinking, feeling and acting. It's like you spend your life preparing jars to collect the water in a mirage. <laughs> your suffering tells you, go and have a look in the mirage. Go and have a look at this water you are spending your entire life organizing and planning around. What are you, what's going to happen when you go up to the mirage and see the water isn't there? What's going to happen to your, your water jar business? You're just going to lose interest in it. You're just going to stop manufacturing. Yeah? There's no water there to collect. You just forget it and move on. So suffering is saying, go up to the mirage. See that there is no water there. Go into your experience. See that there is no separate self there. And that seeing will, will take care of everything else. And then if you want, you can engage, which I, I know you do want to, you can engage in these loving contemplations, which is a, a kind of cooperation with the dismantling of the water jar business. It's a way of going up to the mirage, right? No, no, it's, 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 it's post going up to the mirage. It's a post-enlightenment so sadhana. <laughs> what? Enlightenment is seeing what we are. The, the dismantling uh, of the water jar business is a post-enlightenment sadhana. It's what we do after the recognition of our true nature. And it's just a gentle, loving cooperation at the level of the body with what we have already understood. It, it's We're just helping the body feel itself in a way that is consistent with our new understanding. Honestly, maybe uh, haven't experienced the enlightenment part. <laughs> well, it, it, in practice it, here, we, we we work on both. Going back to the very beginning of our uh, of our week here, we we work on both the path of exclusion and the path of inclusion at the same time. We 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 range all over the map. So so, don't don't worry if this extraordinary event called enlightenment doesn't seem to have taken place. It, 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 Remember, enlightenment is not an event. It doesn't take place. The mind is not party to it. It's not present when this non-event occurs. It knows nothing of it. So don't worry about that. Just keep exploring what you truly are. Am I a separate, limited awareness? Or is the awareness that I know myself to be totally open, unlimited and ever-present. Because the belief and the feeling that what I am comes and goes and is limited and therefore lacking, that is at the heart. That belief and feeling, that single belief and feeling is at the heart of all your suffering. That's the only thing in suffering that needs to be explored, not the whole paraphernalia of whatever it is that seems to be causing the suffering because if you explore each of the causes in turn it's just endless money work relationships I mean, it goes on forever but it's all all these different colors 
different facets of suffering, they, it all hinges on one thing, the belief that what I am, the, the I that is knowing my thoughts and hearing these words right now, the awareness that I know myself to be, shares the limits and the destiny of the body-mind. That's it. That is, with that belief, we seem to shrink into a separate self and all our suffering is dependent upon that belief and feeling alone. So once that's clear, you become very, you become naturally one-pointed. You see that all your suffering is just based on one thing. So all your disparate energies are now gathered together in that one direction. What am I truly? You even forget about suffering you, because you're, 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 you're dealing with what's at the heart of it. You, you forget about the paraphernalia of suffering. Who is this one, this self, that is suffering? Who is this one on whose behalf I spend my life thinking and feeling? acting and relating. I, I spend my life serving this self. Who, who is it? I've never seen it. Where are you? C come out. I want to make your acquaintance. Show me what you're made of. The analogy I, I give you, you may have heard it before sometimes is of, of, a, of a servant who's been living in this big old house serving an old man all his life and the old man is extremely demanding and unreasonable. And the servant, you know, he's up at five o'clock every morning, cleaning his shoes, making his fire, doing his breakfast, etc. He spends his whole life from morning to night serving this old man. And, and yet he never actually sees the old man. The old man is a bit of a recluse and he lives in his bedroom. Uh, he just gets met. The old man just has a routine. Sorry, the servant has a routine. He just goes through his routine. Um, um, he begins to get curious. He goes to the pub every now and then on a rare day off, and his friends tell him, "You know, you should, you should go and, you know, you should go and talk to the old man. You should go and see him if he's so unreasonable." So eventually, you go back and you pluck up courage. You go and knock on the door. You want to, to discuss your your work with him, and he doesn't answer. You think, "Oh, that's typical. He, he just doesn't want to talk to me." But then the next day, you pluck up courage again, and you, you knock on the door. He doesn't answer. You think, oh, I'm going to I'm going to open the door. So you open the door and you you just peek in. And you think, oh, that's funny, I can't see him. And then the next day you have a bit more courage, you open the door a bit more and you put your head around the door and you know, he's not there. So then you get a bit bolder, you go in and, and you look around and you think, oh, it's funny, he's just not here. You look in his bathroom, you think he must be there. He's not there. You look in his cupboards, he's not there. You look in the drawer, you, you explore the whole room. And, and you realise, this man that I've been serving all my life, this tyrannical man on whose behalf I have been laboring, he's not there. He was never there. The separate self is like that. We spend our lives thinking, feeling, acting and relating on behalf of a self that is not there. So that's what we do here. We explore the bedroom. First the bedroom, then the bathroom, then the cupboards, then the drawers. We look everywhere. And the more we look, the, the, the greater our confidence grows in knowing that he's not there. Now, it doesn't necessarily happen at one moment. Okay, now I've discovered that it's not there. There is just a growing confidence day by day. It may come in one moment, but it usually doesn't. It's just this confidence, this conviction grows in you. He's not there. And in proportion to that conviction, your thoughts, feelings, activities and relationships begin to, to change accordingly in direct proportion to your conviction that the old man is not there. You may never be able to say, 
at that moment I discovered he wasn't there. It's not necessary. Most people can't say that. Sure, if I've got a question, I, I wanted to say something about that. It, that um, meditation experience. Um, so, what I noticed, what I noticed is a uh, well, like like an, an an expansion, a kind of um, which feels very very freeing, very liberating. So, like there's just a lot of space. And then at the same time, the body is going mad. It's like a kind of, it's like all the, all the sort of physical aches are, are, are coming up even more strongly. And normally they go after about 10 minutes, but it's, it was like they were like in full, you know, technicolor kind of. Yes. Um, particularly my my rib cage, which I've been noticing more and more and more, and it sort of, I sometimes feel like I'm wearing a corset. And so that was like it was sort of almost like iron. Yes. And at the same time, there's this this expansion. Um, so there's a kind of wonder and a a beauty in that, uh, and at the same time within that. It's like there's a, I, can, I feel a fight going on. Yes. For, and I, I recognize the, the conditioning in the body. I, I can feel, I could name that as wanting to kind of win, if you like. And, and I, I've never felt so clearly the, the, the meeting of those two. It's like they're kind of locked almost. Yes. No, I, I want, you know, and then I come back here. And, um, And also, I'm feeling, um, yeah, tears, sort of sadness for this apparent illusion. Um, and at home, when I, I, I feel a, a kind of frustration. It's like, it's almost, it's sort of the analogy of like being in this tightly held prison and something crying, you know, let me out. Um, and that's that's that is how how it how it appears. And I, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for the such clarity in the the fight because it it yeah it brings more 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 clarity in in. This is kind of the struggle that I, I experience. Yes. Um, and something about... There is something I can do and there's nothing I can do. Yes. Again, it feels yes. like a bit Yes, it, it's... Th this process, if we can call it a process, is, is working perfectly in you. It's just... You, you you describe this expansion and, and the, this morning's meditation was just one way of approaching this expanded view of, of experience and when we begin to really feel and live in this expansion all the old habits with which we used to contract into a separate self are, are revealed they begin to rebel most of the time normally we're not no, we don't notice them because it's just our normal state this contracted state has just become the norm so it, it feels natural normal it doesn't cause any 
problem. Well, it does cause trouble from time to time, but we, we've kind of uh, uh, accommodated it, this contracted state, and we live more or less harmoniously with it. Then we take this more expanded view, and suddenly all these... Um, all these uh, habits of being contracted, which we previously didn't notice, now begin to come up in, in rebellion because they're being challenged by this new way of feeling and perceiving. And in fact, they're being exposed. So sometimes we feel, oh, there are all these new resistances coming up. They're, they're not really new resistances. They're just... they're ancient resistances of which we were previously unaware. So uh, it's very good, this uh, the revealing of this rebellion I I in the body. And as you say, there is a kind of fight going on in between them. W which one are you going to be? Where are you going to... The, the old contracted state of the body has become kind of familiar it's we've made our peace with it we're we're used to it and yet now we're being invited into something which is actually far more expansive far more truly in line with what we what we want and yet as you say there is some nostalgia for the old for, for, for the old pair of shoes that you're about to throw out um, so there can be a bit of a back and forth between the two and, and the body will sometimes you can actually feel it in a very physical way particularly for instance this morning when we were imagining breathing in the space behind the body it's much more difficult than in front of the body and you can feel yourself going there behind the body and then almost like a spring pulling you back through habit into being localized so sometimes it seems that you actually have to make a bit of an effort Although it is in fact the natural state to, to live in this expanded openness, because of the habit of contracting, we think that it's natural to be contracted and therefore, to begin with, we feel that we have to make an actual effort to go into the space. It's not really a new effort. It's, it's like um, the analogy I give sometimes, when you, if you clench your fist like this and you hold it for a long time, you forget that you're holding it. You think it's natural. And then when somebody says, open your hand, what you actually have to do is relax an effort. But you're not aware of that. You feel you have to make a new effort to open the hand. It's not a new effort. It's the relaxation of an old effort that you were no longer aware of. So that's what we're doing. It's like a relaxation of the hand. It feels like a new effort sometimes. Gosh, I have to try to move into this space. But actually it's not. It's just the relaxation of tensions and contractions that we weren't even aware of because we've become so used to them. I think I, f I find it when I'm, when I'm here and you're, you're leading us, I, I find it relatively easy to, yes. to, to get, do that. And I also notice that when I wake up in the mornings, I, I feel in a, in a kind of similar space. Yes. And there's almost a kind of that moment I get out of bed, something something shifts. Yes. Um, and then I was walking yesterday evening, and and, and that's when I, I notice I'm. It's very familiar. It's like I'm not really walking. I'm kind of going somewhere. Yes. And there's a again there's a it's very much very very located in this area, the sort of solar plexus rib cage, that there's a pushing. Yes, that's it. A straining at the now. Straining. <laughs> yeah. Like kind of yeah, reminded of a horse. Sort of exactly. Like, that's the sort of same like image <laughs> came to me. A, yeah. a horse that's just yeah. pulling on the and you but when you that's a perfect example, you know the exercise we did the exploration we did yesterday when we were hearing and hearing the sound at a distance and, and seeing the flower. And, and kind of slightly straining to go out towards it and then taking our stand as awareness and allowing the object to come to us. So you can do that when you're walking. You feel this, just this straining at the now. Even when you're going for a walk in nature, you feel you're just, you're always in becoming. You're always just 
just outside the now, or just straining for the now to become the next moment. And so you can experiment with this while you're walking. J just walk and feel this, and then feel what it's like to be totally 100% in the now, with no sense of, the ne of grasping for the next moment, of needing the next moment to replace the current one, and feel the quality of your walking. How it changes. Yeah, I mean, I, what I do, I slow down, and that obviously. Helps. Yes, it it, it 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 sometimes, literally means you slow down. But even if it, there's no slowing down, there's a kind of relaxation of a very slight tension in the body. And that tension is the separate self. This subtle rejection of the now, straining at the edge of the now, wanting it to become the next now. In other words, we live in becoming rather than being. And this becoming it can be very subtle, just just this just this straining at the edge of the now, wanting it to to become the next moment. I mean, I, I also notice it when I'm cleaning my teeth. That's, that's very obvious that I actually want to be somewhere else. Yes. You know, and and just to name that. Yes. To bring more presence yes. and Relaxation. Yes. yes. You see, awareness is never straining at the now. Awareness is just a wide open yes to the now. Totally lazy. Just not the slightest impulse to avoid the now. It's only a th I, the thought and feeling made self, that is pushing at the now, wanting it to become the next moment. The, the separate self lives on, on the edge of the now, in that becoming, right on the edge of the now, wanting the next now to happen. That is the separate self. That's all it's made out of. It's mad, and, and we, we we spend we spend our lives there at, at that in that becoming in, in a state of perpetual becoming. We never become what we want to become. It's always just more becoming. What we want to become is the being that is already there. Yes, it it's it's really mad. What we, what we are straining towards is what is already present prior to the straining in this just being present, which is what awareness is, being present, being present, open, aware. experience was the process fun in any way? Oh yes, yes, <laughs> great fun. The reason I ask is when you were describing to Jeremy the um, process of looking in the bedroom, looking in the drawers, it makes me think it's uh, potentially it's a bit of a game and my own experience of it is that I t potentially take it very, very seriously and boy it's going to be so much easier or more enjoyable if it's if we do treat it like a game or a bit of fun yes I wonder if you can comment on that When I, when I say it was it was fun, I, I was a very kind of serious, earnest, disciplined young man. So it was it was um, a little bit like Jeremy. Um, <laughs> so it, it was uh, let's say enjoyable 
rather than fun. Fun would be a bit would have been a bit too much for me in the early days, but it was enjoyable and interesting. It was so it's true. I didn't really treat it like a a game, in the sense that I couldn't care less about its its outcome. I'm just playing cards with a friend. It wasn't that kind of a game because it was I was passionately interested. It's more like it's more like um learning to play a musical instrument you, you do it because it's it's joyful it's you, so the purpose of it is just the joy of playing music so in that sense it's it's the most beautiful light-hearted thing you can do but nevertheless on the way there are certain things that you have to do like pay very careful attention to your fingers or the relaxation in your fingers or to a difficult configuration of notes or something so that requires a little bit of attention and, and focus and you don't do it in oh I couldn't care less kind of attitude you know that you think I, I really want to learn why is this change just these change from these why is it so difficult it's because there's tension in my fingers I I want to learn to relax my fingers and so you do these little exercises and things it, it's it's enjoyable. It's interesting. It's but it's not. Uh, it's not fun in this. Oh, I couldn't care less whether this. No, I, I care. I, I I want my fingers to be relaxed. Or you have an equivalent in sports or whatever. So it's the purpose of it is is yes. In, in this case, the the joy of of music. But there may be some some times when when there's an intense focus. It may appear to be very serious from the outside, but inside you're light-hearted about it because it's it's so interesting, it's so enjoyable. Somebody else from the outside will say, "Oh, he's so disciplined." From the inside, it doesn't feel like discipline; it feels like love. You're you're, you're doing, and in this case, you're trying to train your body to do something you want it to do, and it's struggling a little bit because it's a, it's a bit afraid and therefore it's tense. So you're just helping it to, to 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 perform in the way that you know to be the way you, you know it has to be in order to play the music. It's so in the inside, yes, it may be intense, it may be serious, but it's very loving. From the outside, you say, "Oh, he practices for hours. He's disciplined." It, it's not that. It's not a disciplined. That's why I, I don't use the word practicing or exercises or, or discipline because they've got connotations. They've acquired connotations that that make us feel they're somehow there to confront our natural incl inclinations. No, this should go with your natural inclinations. That's why I said earlier to, to Jeremy, it should be what you what you love to do. Now, what you love to do sometimes requires you to be serious. That's okay. Not not serious in a heavy way. It can be light and enjoyable and loving and and sometimes serious. And for you, was a lightheartedness there from the start, or no? No, in my case, it took a while to get lighthearted. I was rather earnest, and and um, <laughs> to begin with, the, the lightheartedness came. It it it. it it came in time, um, but I, I misunderstood the spiritual process early on, and made it unnecessarily heavy. It's not necessary. Um, it really wasn't until I met my teacher that I uh, that I realised that that it was an enjoyable process and in particular when uh, you see what was really fun for me was my artwork because I, I, I loved beauty I, I loved truth as well but they were in two different camps there was truth over here that was what I did in my the Advaita school and on my cushion and reading Ramana Maharshi in my bedroom and then there was my love of beauty and they were uh, I felt a little apologetic about my love of beauty because it involved the senses, you know, what, what I see and what I hear and what I touch. And, and in the classical Advaita tradition, the world is, is considered to be a little bit dangerous and you, you, wanna, you don't want to go there. 
So I, I felt a little apologetic of my love of form and, and, and beauty. And it wasn't until I met my teacher that I realized that these two loves, the love of truth and the love of beauty, are the same thing. And that, that released a, a huge amount of misunderstanding for me. It was like taking the, taking the lid off for me. And, and from, from that moment on, when, when these two worlds came together, my whole approach to spirituality became much more uh, playful and, and particularly because we were doing all these experiential exercises, explorations that, that we've been doing here, exploring where does hearing take place, where, where does seeing take place, well, what is hearing made out of, what is touching, all these things. It was so... I, I was right there because I had spent a life... Uh, seeing and making and so I had all this all the tools were already there and now all those tools that I'd just used in my work were now being applied I had been doing these higher sensing exercises what, what he used to call higher sensing these um, uh, exploring the tactile sense exploring sounds exploring sounds I'd been doing it without knowing it when I used to go to museums and look at pieces and in my studio, I had been doing it, but now I was being given a context and it was being elaborated, so it was, uh, th I was so enthusiastic about it. It was so exciting to, to, uh, uh, to you know, to, to go to experience, whatever experience was, and to, and to explore it. So, so it, it changed at a certain time. Me. When, it, when, it, when I really connected it with my experience, when it was no longer just a, a mental discipline, when I could really involve all of my experience together and everything came together as part of the same exploration, it became exciting. You used the word playful, which seems really poignant, maybe better than game or fun. Yes, playful. I, I, I remember very early on in... in um, California with Francis, he, he was doing a, uh, it was probably the second or third retreat I, I had been on, and he was doing a medit doing, making up these kind of contemplations like, like we did today, something like that, so I would immediately go off and start making up my own, I, I just immediately started creating my own kinds of experiments, and, and then I would come in the meeting in the evening and, and, and say, I, I've just been making up I want to make sure that I'm on on the right track, and so, so then I would explain the the contemplations that I was making up for myself, and then I wanted to check out uh, that that it was uh, I was in the right track, and and he just said, oh yeah, absolutely, that 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 that's it, that's the way to go. Just be creative, make up your own own experiments, and and then the next morning in meditation, he actually said, he said, okay, this morning we'll do the Rupert meditation, and then he used the meditation that I had made up the day before, and this was, it was so sweet of him, because it was like a, it was like him saying to me, yes, th this is, this is the way I let you know that you're doing, keep going like that, be creative, I'm just giving you samples, you don't have to, you don't have to think, okay, what, what did we do in that exploration yesterday? I've got to go through exactly. I'm just giving you a taste, to give you lots of different ideas of the way to explore experience. But everyone's experience is slightly different. So you might have a, a tendency towards, uh, you, can, you can go there, you make up your own. So it, yes, it was playful, it was creative, enjoyable. In that sense, it was, it was fun, it was interesting. It was what I wanted to do with my time. And then I would go on retreats, and over the years, like is happening here, the same people would be showing up on retreats, sometimes new people, and sometimes people that came. So there was this nice sense of kind of family, in, in the best sense of the word, a kind of community without any expectations, without any rules, without any demands, without expectations. We, there was this loose community of friends that would just meet from time to time. And this feeling of friendship, this beautiful quality of friendship that that uh, takes place in gatherings like this because we're no one's here to prove anything or defend anything so we all meet very innocently and openly and, and I noticed this lovely quality of friendship so I used to be a recluse in, in I spent 25 years as a recluse in my studio you know never going out and suddenly I found I had all these beautiful friends all over the world 
and, and that was it was so nice to go on on retreats and and to be together with friends and then to come home and to keep exploring all this and so yes it, it was enjoyable creative playful fun enthusiastic interesting i mean the old ideas that spiritual life is it kind of thwarts your natural inclinations and and your it takes everything you really want to do away from you and, and sits you down on a mat and you, where you have to wrap out a mantra and discipline your mind and discipline your body and you you know I hear of retreats where nobody not only do they not, they don't talk to each other you're not even allowed to look at each other in the eye I mean for God's sake how are you going to discover that you're one with someone if you're not able to look at them in the eye I mean what could be more separating and isolating than that now I, I'm not I, I don't uh, to put that con commenting in context in a particular context I understand that a, a silent retreat it, it is beautiful and has its benefits I, I can't quite see the, the lack of eye contact thing but I, I, I guess in a certain context it may also have its benefits so I don't mean to <laughs> criticize that out of context but it's not the approach we we take here it's 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 not a disciplined approach it's a loving approach in fact true discipline is a movement of love so the answer is yes if that's what you mean by fun it was fun <laughs> and it still is it still is fun it still is enjoyable because we we hang out together here as friends what we do here is is so much more than just guided meditations and conversations uh, what we do it spills out into our into our meals I mean there's nothing more delightful than you know look, waking up this morning and everyone's having breakfast on, on the grass talking and, and because of this quality of friendship I mean most of us didn't know each other two days ago three days ago and already there's a quality of friendship that sometimes takes years to develop and that is that that is a, the flowering of this understanding. It's one area in which it flowers in the quality of our friendships. Thank you. <laughs>